the story so far. Always looking a bit perky, don't you think? We've been playing a compilation of very dull programs in Patricia's brain. And for some reason, they've come out transformed. Brilliant. Yes. Find your own hospital. Well, in that case, prepare him for the operating theatre. So that's the story so far. Faster. We must get him into surgery at once. Well, what if he dies under the knife? Well, none of us lives forever. There are worse ways of dying, you know. Jimi Hendrix, for example, he drowned in the pool of his own vomit. Must take a lot of vomit to fill up a pool. I want to be with him. Listen, he had to be there when I gave birth, so it's my duty to be with him when you open his brain up. Say, I'd like to capture it all. I'm a new camcorder. Ah, so you want to film me in action, eh? Well, they do say you're the most gifted surgeon operating in television. Yes, all the stars come to me. I do the impediments. Impediments? You know, to get them noticed. Give the duller ones a bit of personality. I cut my teeth on Magnus Pike's arms. I cut my arms on Esther Lanson's teeth. Then there's the Anne Robinson wink. Hold of Patrick Moore. So you know on Newsnight, that insane look Peter Snell gets from time to time. Mine. Drew a blank on Nick Ross, though. The Secret Life of Television in 600 Parts. Part 56, TV Eccentrics. <laughs> Oxbridge, city of dreaming spies and students cycling backwards to the strains of Tibetan funeral music in a desperate bid to make the beginning of this documentary less cliché with me. Start again. Oxbridge, a worthy but dull place, full of tedious scholars spending long hours in solitary study. But academics who spend too much time on their own develop strange habits, which are noticed by their students. Years later, one of these students joins the BBC and before long, the slightly quirky academic is signed up and becomes... a full-blown nutty professor with his own television series. Why? Most academics have gigantic egos and seriously want to be rich and famous and a grown-up version of this... Why? Revenge. TV producers are cretinous, vulgar yobbos, but they are also failed academics, and they are delighted to see academics humiliated. It makes them feel smarter. Uh, you're not listening to me, are you? Pay attention, please, or I will have to put on this. You know you don't like that. Here are some of the basic types of eccentric. They are, in fact, three pretty elderly specimens. Welcome, Heinz Wolf, the classic Viennese loony professor straight from central casting. Say hello, Heinz. Heinz enjoys talking with an over-the-top Viennese accent because he thinks it gives him gravitas. I still vividly remember making a self-propelled salami. Utterly ludicrous. And welcome, Professor Wolf Lund. He, in fact, doesn't belong to a university and is not really a professor at all. And there are a few things in life more tragic than professors who have lost their faculties. But here is one of the few things in life that is more tragic. They're pranking and showing themselves off. But Welcome yeah. Sister Wendy, the calculating nun. She'd done her research. She knew what TV wanted. Buck teeth and a wimple couldn't fail. You're a scheming old Carmelite, aren't you? All these people are eccentric, but never mad. TV doesn't want mad people, unless they clog up their drains in fascinating ways. Eccentrics, on the other hand, are like pandas. Cute and utterly sexless. They look a bit funny, but they won't put their hand up your dress. Of course, there are rare exceptions. The moral of this story is that TV is a duplicitous medium. And the immoral of this story is big breasts and winkles and being tied up with rope. Now leave me alone or I'll call the police. Risibility is down to ten yards, Captain. My God, folks, I was warned risibility was going to be poor on this show, but I had no idea it would be so bad. May I say, Captain, in a cheery bluff, chirpy cockney Walmart, it's Sam Kid B movie, third rate actor sort of way, that even if we found ourselves with no risibility at all, the men are right behind oh, you, yeah. sir. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, there's only one thing for it, Bosun. Yeah. You'll have to be risible. You're the man for the job. Me, sir? Yes, you're. Uh, aye, aye, sir. Right, here goes. Uh, 
How many policemen does it take to crack open an egg? I don't know, Boson. How many policemen does it take to crack open an egg? Uh, well, none, sir. Huh? And anyway, the egg slipped and fell down the stairs by itself of its own accord. Got it? Oh, dear. It's a joke, Captain. You see, brutality, police brutality. Yes, that's right, oh, dear. Elizabeth, this is getting worse. Quick, do that thing you do with my timbers. What, 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 do you want them shivered, sir? That's fighting talk, you hunk of manhood. With your tutu and your ballet shoes, you should be fully blocked, you hear me? Fully blocked. security reasons. Going down. Quickly now, man. Plug him into that huge socket. What socket? Any socket, you idiot. Every second counts. With respect, sir, don't call me an idiot. I've got a brother at Oxford University. And a bottle in the biology department doesn't count. Port talk, madam, ladies present. <laughs> oh, fantastic. That's all we need. Let's hope he's okay. I'll call the switchboard, sir. <coughs> Hello? What's that you say? Everyone has gone home for the weekend? And what's that you say? But you'll send for the fire brigade immediately? And what's that you say? Even though there wasn't time just then for you to have said anything at all? This phone is dead, and I'm just playing a cruel trick on my fellow detainees? <laughs> Forgive me, I am not as other men. My sense of humour has been cruelly warped by the tragedies I confront daily. What tragedies? I had to have the Sierra 1.3 last week. The 1.6 was in for maintenance. The I Spy Book of the Police. Number one, the old-fashioned police car. The old-fashioned police car had a nice, relaxing bell. Its gentle ting a ling a ling a ling a ling a ling a ling had a soothing effect upon officers' nerves. Nowadays, however, police cars driven by Her Majesty's filth have nasty sirens that go whip, 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 whip all day, and it gets on their nerves, which is why... Policemen naturally lose their tempers. Poor loves. Ah, oh, well, bit of good honest copper never did anyone any harm, eh? <laughs> Number two. Can you spot the policemen who know they're being filmed with black people? They develop an irresistible urge to smile, put their helmets askew, and dance in the street. But can you spot policemen who do not know that they are being filmed with black people? they develop an irresistible urge to make black people dance. What a marvellous sense of rhythm these honky coppers have. And if you wonder why the crime rate is soaring, it is because the entire Metropolitan Police are far too busy. Constructing large human pyramids on motorbikes. Oh, I... Number three. This is a highly intelligent animal with an IQ of 35. As for the dog, it has been specially trained to cause offence. Police do not wish to cause offence. We do not wish to cause offence. Life's too short, so it's Nigel. He's short. Owning bread is short. I'm under arrest. Yes, I'll come quietly, officer, but I may grunt a bit at the end. <laughs> Number four. Can you spot an old-fashioned, polite policeman? They used to spend their day drinking tea, telling the time, patting children on their heads, saying evening all, and directing strangers to the local hospital as opposed to impolite policemen who will arrange it for you personally. <laughs> and now, it's the quiz of the week. What is the only animal in the world with an arsehole halfway up its back? Answer. A police horse. <laughs>
can't stand the police myself, Governor. Mm. Book me for double parking on an anal cyst. Anal cyst. I mean, you don't need it, do you, Gov? I'd had a busy day at the orifice. Oh, God. An hour later, they stopped me again, said I was going the wrong way up a vein. Mm. I thought it was a bleeding artery, didn't I? Mm. God, treat you like a load of old toot. Look out, look where you're going! Oh, blimey. The Magical Voice of Frank Sinatra, brought to you on a brand new album, Old Blue Eyes Sings Those Ridiculous Things Rampant Feminists Say. Yes, Frank is back. He's angry. Listen as he croons his way through an hour of women's issues and tingle to his evergreen hit. All men are rapists. Yeah. Chop off their ghoulies. Give me the knife and I'll do it myself. Yes, thrilled to a whole hour of inverted sexism and unreconstructed Andrea Dworkin. Plus, thrill as he challenges conventional male stereotypes of female beauty. Whoops, there grows a hairy mole on my face. I don't use a Mac. Thrill as Frank's dear friend, Jermaine Greer, joins him on stage for a duet of consciousness raising. I've got a pair of dungarees. I wear a donkey jacket and a pair of ducks. Other classic recordings included are Let's Overthrow the Patriarchal State, plus the ever-popular Eight out of ten feminists said that they preferred whiskers. Let's call the whole thing off. I don't think I can stand much more of this. How much longer are we going to be stuck here, trapped like Trappist monks? How long is a piece of string? 26 inches, madam. So many people mm. ask, I decided to set the standard. I think I'm losing the will to live. We've got to keep up morale. They teach you that when you subscribe to Apocalypse Monthly, the survivalist magazine. It taught me all about living off the natural fauna didn't actually mention lifts, but the same principles apply. Now, I suggest we all pan out and search for nutrition. You look behind the buttons, you frisk the floor, I'll examine this rubber on the doors. It's time for a roundup of the day's events from your region, presented by a man who was pitifully desperate to get out of local radio, but is now even more desperate to get onto network television. So long as it's network, he'll do anything. Morning quiz shows, appear with Ross King, he'll do the cookery slot, he'll do anything. But unfortunately, he'll still be here in 30 years' time, presenting non-news stories on Gone West. <laughs> Local lollipop man escorts child from one side of the road to other. We have pictures. Local news reader's auto queue gets stuck, but. Then it starts working again. And the Warrington and District Dyslexia Choral Society are here to sing their version of. Old MacDonald at a farm. Take it away. Out come Lord and had the fram, F-I-F-I-K, and on that fram he hit a pog, Z-L-Z-L-M. What a hink, hink, thaw, not a hank, hank, rise, or a hink, thaw, a hank, of him or a honking, out come Lord and lick a yaw, Z-K-Z-K-B, gobble, blim, a lick a yaw, Z-K-Z-K-B. Nella, Nella, Broxic, Glom, Grellem, Jigs and Pigs, With a wank, quick wank on a broom, trick, sock, Grim, rob, rob, a grim, yabba, yabba, spink, spunk, Help, get, lord, and go! Oh, 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 o
Tell you what, I do like a good tuba shelf, Gov. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I just hope you're not going to sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Anyway, I've been told I've got a very good voice, I have. Oh, no. There you go. I had that yo-yo ma in the back of my cab. Oh. He said I've got Van Gogh's ear for music, so I must be good, eh? Really? Eh? Really? Eh? Really? Look, would you just shut your cake off? Oh. You're just a narrative linking device. Get me to kith and kin instantly. Uh, yeah, yeah, never mind about that. Anyway, have you heard my rendition of the Big Horse song, Gov? Big Horse song? Yeah. Big Horse song? Yeah. That's right, yeah, the Big Horse song. Maybe it's a big horse. I'm a Londoner. Oh no! I like oh, London my God. So. oh my Maybe God! Oh my God! Two family trees collide in kith and kin. Throughout the ages, the worlds of war and music have often collided. One thinks of Mozart's 1812 overture by Haydn, of Beethoven's Erotica Symphony, ah! Adolf Hitler and his Berliner Bunker Banjo Boys. But rarely have the arts of war and peace coexisted so completely as in the lives of Norman Schwarzkopf and his wife, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. Norman, the distinguished military commander recently decorated by President Clinton, Elizabeth, the legendary opera singer recently decorated by Artex. But their careers did not start out that way. For few realize that Norman was once an accomplished classical musician and that Elizabeth was one of the most brilliant military tacticians of her generation. Berlin, 1949. Norman, the dazzling young American pianist, was making his European debut. After the concert, he met Oberleutnant Elizabeth, his chief bouncer, roadie and groupie for the evening. They fell in love and were soon secretly married. A few days later, the newlywed couple appeared on German TV's answer to Mr. and Mrs., the hilarious panel game, Damen und Herren. The show was an intellectual tour de force, with couples having to guess how many nickels make a muckle and pick buttercups after they dropped their buttocks on the floor. The show's winners were given a brand new twin tub washing machine, while the losers had to pay a forfeit by swapping careers with their partners. Norman and Elizabeth lost. So next day, he enlisted in the army. She began to study music, taking up operatic singing, but turning out to be not so much bel canto as can belto. Within five years, both had risen to the top of their new professions. But there were teething problems. No, there were metaphorical teething problems especially when Norman led a battalion of crack troops from the Nelson Riddle Orchestra into Vietnam, resulting in hundreds of casualties and the hit song, I Did It My Lay. Dear, dear. Wonderful. Got some nice LPs out. They're with us tonight in full force. Can we present? Norman and Elizabeth toured the world's concert halls, their combination of musical skill and uncompromising military tactics, ensuring one triumph after another. It was simple. Either Elizabeth's recitals received excellent reviews, or Norman blew the country up. But it's the right thing to do. Their careers prospered until their fateful decision to take part in the 1991 Q8 Music Festival, giving the premiere of Norman's latest composition. Saddam Hussein, President of Iraq, direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, and a crumhorn virtuoso was planning to give a celebrity recital at the festival. During a break in their final rehearsal, Saddam Hussein, after checking through a spy hole that the platform was clear, stole a small but vital section of Norman's organ and waved this gleefully before an audience from the Arts Council. Norman was outraged at this blatant act of provocation and prepared for war. With the death of Bernstein, he was the obvious man to lead the retaliation from the West. An orchestral build-up began in the Gulf area. Musicians everywhere flocked to join his troops. The rest is history. Their names live forever in the annals of legend, the halls of fame, the corridors of power, the windmills of your mind, the dust that gathers at the back of your video that you can never hoover out, the tumble dryer that you put an even number of socks into but always get an odd number out. Their names live forever. Anyone want to go on my corn plaster? Corn on a cop? Nice little snack between meals? 
I read that 40 air crash victims in the Andes survived for five weeks on a pair of Dr. Scholl's sandals. Not just at the moment. My throat's too dry. What I really need is a drink. Visibility is down to four yards. God. Things are getting worse. I think you better take command of the comedy, Captain. Take command of the comedy? Yeah. All right, listen to this, men. How much is this ill octopus worth? Six quid, Captain. Oh, dear, this is desperate. Hang on a minute. That sounds like Stranger on the Shore, and it's coming from the seabed. What is it, Captain? What is it? Acker Welk. Oh, I see, Captain. That's highly amusing, that is, because the word Welk sounds exactly like the word Bilk, except for the first bit. Oh, dear, it looks uh, as if the ratings are going to go down on me, that's for sure. Anything's possible on this ship, sir. <laughs> Enough of that felt. Look, Captain, risibility's improving. All right. All right. Forget the craze. It's your Siamese twins that really get away with murder. One of them kills somebody, so you arrest him. But the other one's innocent. If you lock up the guilty one, the other will sue you for wrongful imprisonment. I'm not sure, Anna, the Of course, if we still had hanging, it'd be even trickier. I'm very much against hanging Siamese twins. I'm a liberal, you know. Look at him. He always wanted to be on the BBC. Funny to think that now he actually is the BBC. Determined to get into show business, was he? He even used to take a bow when the fridge door light came on. Now look at him. Stuck on a life support machine in a broken down lift with total strangers drinking his piss. Not exactly Caesar's palace, is it? <laughs> I'm escaping via the roof. I shall make my way to the Moulin Rouge where I intend to have sexual intercourse with Josephine Baker. Paris! Here I come! Ah! Have 200 grams of morphine to his drip when we get out, will you, nurse? No option. Madam, I'm afraid we shall have to eat your husband. Nothing important, only the extremities. Excellent idea. Do you mind if I swallow a small portion of your husband, madam? Well, help yourself, but you won't enjoy it. Speak from experience. Thank you. 
I'll start with the fingers. Leave it out! I want to use fingers! Oh, you bloody idiot, you've kicked out the plug! Oh, the lift has started. Oh, quick, we've got to plug him back in. Oh, we may be too late. There could be severe damage to the brain. Again! Right, this is as far as we can go, Gov. All right. Yeah, we'll have to take the lift up your spinal column. Ooh. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll slip him through your coccyx, all right? Oh, you can't say coccyx. Huh? It's rude. Oh, I can, Gov. Really? I've got a artistic license. Ooh, yeah. Look, here, clause 12B, I can make general bodily references and willy jokes up to any size. Uh. Anyway, what a week you've had, eh, Gov? Yeah. Old Blue Eyes singing about airy harm pits. Yes, and I've been yeah. unplugged from the mains and they yeah. drank my wee-wee. Oh, and I'll probably die in episode five. Yeah, yeah. well, if you ask me, yeah. you've been dying for four episodes already. Uh, uh, you're right. Uh, anyway, it's time my alter ego lashed out. Lashed. Lashed. Hello? Hello? Yes? It's a long distance from London, England. Yes? And that's all. It's just, I was just telling you it's a long distance from London, England. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I understand you're the best plastic surgeon in New York. Okay. I have a problem. Uh, I'm listening. I'm yeah, trying yeah, to listen to you. I can hardly hear you. Okay. I have a problem. Apropos River Phoenix's untimely drugs death, I find myself next in line for sexual adoration. Um, I'll have women at my door, there'll be a lot of problems. Uh, I have a, a, an unusual request in, uh, can the doctor make me plainer? Plainer? Yeah, ugly. I mean, for example... Ugly? For example, could you make me so ugly that if I went to the film The Elephant Man, I'd be signing autographs in the foyer for an hour after it? You have to make an appointment for this uh, type of... Right. Or do you do a reverse liposuction, you know, so that instead of taking stuff out, it could put a tube in it, it would go <laughs> like that, and then I'd be about 50 stones. You'd have to come in for a consultation. All right, but as soon as I come in, you'd stick it up, would you? Uh, just one thing, I'm a bit worried about melting in front of the fire. Does that ever happen? Never. And you think that he might be able to put the nose actually on the forehead? Sure. Dr. Lawrence would have to see you. First. All right, okay, then. Uh, one other thing, do you deal with sex problems? Sexual problems? Yeah, the thing is that women always say I'm a lousy lover, but I, I, I always say to them, how can you tell in five seconds? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to go. The other phone is ringing. All right, well, you put me eyeballs in me armpits. <laughs> I don't know. You should really consult a priest. Goodbye. Oh, please, please. <laughs> What a funny lot. BBC Two's Late Show launches a special week of science. The Late Show investigates the decline of the space age. Do you think it's lost in space forever? Philosopher Ray Monk lifts the lid on brain research. Roger, stand by. And fashion victim or virus victim, zoologist Richard Dawkins explains how a trend spreads like a virus. It's all the same, do you copy? Does wrinkles in time help prove the theory of Big Bang? Reading you loud and clear. And back on Earth, how to be a TV scientist. Who are they? Where do they come from? Yeehaw! The Late Show Science Week! Okay, cue the wolf. Newsnight is in a couple of minutes on BBC Two after a moving story from Sarajevo.